Hello, everybody. Welcome to the What Culture Gaming Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Tilford, joined by Ben Roy Taylor. I've got a cup of tea. He does, and Josh Brown. Oh, yeah, I don't have one, and now I feel like a mug. I do. I was thinking if we, sort of, we make it a weekly thing, people get a cup of tea every Wednesday. Just, I'm just saying, you could start a movement. Why not? Podcast <laughs> I, I, I'm amazed by the levels of the joke in there. Like, does he feel like a mug because I've got a mug, or is it <laughs> like, what is going on here? <laughs> like Twin Peaks, that's for you to figure out. It's I've left it ambiguous. I've given you the uh, the, the bits you need to figure it out for yourself there. It's very oh, much just recording this at three o'clock in the afternoon, but it's all right. Don't worry about it. We've got plenty of things to talk about. There are lots of new games, to be honest. Um, Resident Evil AR very soon, but there is obviously the demos to talk about. There was the Village one last week. There was the Castle one uh, last Sunday. And we've also, we can talk a little bit about Returnal, not too much. We've got the full review coming up on the channel very soon, and we'll dip into a little bit of Nier. Um, but before then, um, Benro, you want to talk a little bit about Republic Commando, the Star Wars re-release <laughs> of a beloved game that you snapped up and apparently is not very good anymore. A beloved game that is a like cheese you've left in a sock <laughs> under the bed and then has been moved from seven different places you've lived over the years yeah. uh yeah it's, it's just especially like i'm playing it on hard I, I imagine it's like maybe a little more forgiving or like medium or whatever right but also like you have to go into the it's weird like i was like how do i play on hard and you have to go into the menu of the game like the, the menu of the game is like a pause <laughs> menu and from there i was what like what's change it no, because when you go new game, it goes like, do you want to play on difficulties? Where it just go, it just goes in. It just you just flow in. But that was one of the things that just like, what's going on here? But from, <laughs> it's very sort of like weird because it's one of the, I think it's one of the first styles games that find that limited your ammo. And mm. then after a while, there's just no ammo in the game goes from use your specialized gun to just use whatever Trandosian uh, like Uzi is lying about or use this shotgun, which is one of the worst shotguns I've ever held in a video game in my is illustrious that life. Because you're on hard, though, would there not be more ammo? On the lowers i don't i don't, i mean i don't know like i they, they probably probably don't adjust the the level placement it's probably just the like more mm. damage taken and uh thing for health it's, it's like a really intense it. tactical thing I, I haven't it's said not really that tactical the ai <laughs> is pathetic and stupid and just crap to the point where you, unless you like tell them to stand in one place they're just going to go and give everyone a kiss get shot by a turret and then they all like and then they're like oh now i'm gonna heal you oh and it's like one after the other walking into a mousetrap as they all fall down and you're like oh god man just I chill out never know what to expect coming into this wednesday podcast <laughs> and as you know living up to its you know weekly name at this point like i did not expect to come in here and hear ben roy go on an impassioned shoot against republic commando you not what i was expecting so can i can i get a time frame i've got i've got the bullets i've got the rounds i've got the scope <laughs> mounted. can i please say something yeah you you, you need to get, jump in with this no no I, I meant for you like you've uh you've oh, um, prepped this yeah it's basically the ai uh, haven't aged well and then the points when they separate you from your squad it's even sort of like oh okay this is just drab and it's just i need to I just want to get through this sort of thing for me in that era of star wars games yeah, it's probably better than something like the Clone Wars game that came out on GameCube and it was like five minutes long or whatever, but like it doesn't hold a, hold a candle to like a Jedi Outcast or Academy or something like that. And I feel right. like when I was a younger child, it was maybe better, but now I'm just like, I'm just going to finish you and then I'm going to say goodnight. Because... I'll make a, a super quick side point. That game has that really weird thing where you can see the helmet on screen like it's, a, yeah. it's an existing hood. I hate that. And it's only in like three games, like it's in that and the Metroid Prime games um, and like a couple of the Ghost Recons. I, I just, no. What, what I'll say is that I'm, I'm, I'm sure you in somewhere will just be triggered by this or like explode. Uh, uh, Stars Bounty Hunter, Bounty yes, Hunter, yes. much better game of that era. Get <laughs> yeah. that, better game, not Republic Commando because my <laughs> God, is that age like cheese? Uh, both available on PlayStation now and wherever else games it is. Are. Um, Josh, do you have any thoughts on maybe your childhood uh, uh, thoughts on these games? Are you going to um, be going back to them, basically? I, I will definitely go back to Republic Commando, mostly because I hadn't played it and I heard good things. But mm. now I've got this opposing view that I'm going to have to you know, figure it out for myself. It was a Star Wars game that I didn't play because I used to have this bias against first-person Star Wars games because I was like, what's the point of that? I don't want to see <laughs> this from first person. I want to be a Jedi. I want to be jumping around. And I remember playing um, you know, one of the 
Kyle Katarn games or maybe mm. even Jedi Academy, you know, when he started in first person, I thought, whoa, 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 hang on. <laughs> this is not what I signed up for. I wanted my to money. Be I want to see my character. I, yes, I, think, I want to see it. I think as, as we should move on, because we shouldn't talk about this game anymore, because it's because uh, it's <laughs> like it's it's probably just the fact that it's like it's a squad based shooter and the AI are just bad. And like there's there's like I don't I, I would you call them like a t- I'm gonna call it a tank, but when I speak about these big enemies that take a lot of damage, I call them Lesnar's because Brock Lesnar's a big scary man, and it's like <laughs> Lesnar Reginosium with its giant cannon of like ray of doom is always going at you and then for the first half of the game they like to shove enemies that always want to just physically hit you so right. you're like sort of like everyone's trying to kiss you and you've got this big laser beams coming from the sky and it's just like just get back a bit and leave me alone will you come on as everyone else is just falling on the floor and dying so you, you basically you wouldn't you wouldn't recommend it that's where you're at it's like i think it's like seven pounds why not I'll play it play on easy <laughs> play on easy probably but it's the uh, just don't rely on the AI. Only ask them to heal you, and that's it. Or just and, don't play on hard. I'm sure it's a lot easier if then, you just don't do it on it's hard. It's not even the hard. Like, there's a quick saves. Well, I guess that's good. More games should have quick saves. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, so. I agree. <laughs> anyway, in terms of newer things, uh, Benroy, you also jumped into the Resident Evil Castle demo that was on Sunday night. This is a much shorter yes. demo, I think. I guess they give you a half an hour window, but you can get through it in about 20 minutes. You sort of just explore the castle. You go up against one of the Dimitri sisters. Lady Dimitri isn't in it, I don't think. I actually forgot this thing was out. I played the village Lady. one, but not the castle one. Lady Dimitris. Thank- Thankfully, we know how to say it now because Ethan says it in the bloody demo. <laughs> After them having their Capcom sort of thing and then everyone else reading the name and then Capcom like, no, Dimitris. But she's in it for a second. She's getting a bottle of wine out of her. I- I- did you two play the visual your experience? Own heart. Did you play? Yeah. Well, in her bottles, she's got wine caskets in the cell. I won't spoil it too much, Josh. But there's like, <laughs> peep, they turn people into wine because, you know, they like to suck <laughs> the old blood. Uh, but yeah, she's in there for a second. She's, she walks off. You get chased by, can't remember, the, the vampire daughter who turns into flies. Yeah. She's in there. Her name is Fly, Fly Girl. And she uh, forces you down into a basement where. You get to sort of fight, fight. I'm going to say this game's equivalent of the molded because you know the molded are like pretty crap and like mm-hmm. you could take them on these little sort of like hooded goblin boys that are like, are, are you semi vampire, semi zombie? Are they not like what? familiars? Like they've sort of been bitten, but they're not fully turned yet. I, I think they're, or they're another level of like, they're not going to let them. F- I think there's in vampire fiction where you can turn someone, but not let them fully turn. So they're yeah. sort of like more, and they're sort of like that. And they can use like swords as well, and, but they're not too clever, but they take a lot. Uh, on standard, they didn't play mm. on hardcore. Don't worry, everyone. Uh, <laughs> play, they take like say five to five shots to the face sometimes. Mm-hmm. So it's it's kind of like, oh, it's it, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what's going on here. I'd, I'd recommend if you did play it or do play it next weekend, buy the shotgun from the Duke. Also, the Duke references uh, the uh, merchant from Resident Evil Four. Mm-hmm. Yes, which is to point out. I thought he I thought he was the same merchant. I thought he'd really let himself <laughs> just, go just... and he was that merchant. But he's apparently it's like a network of merchants merchants yeah. and he references um, that one and says like, oh, what are you buying? And then he goes, yeah, my, he, he says that. And he goes, ah, my mate said that once before. And you're just like, he, what? But, a literal banter merchant. It's yeah, he time. is. <laughs> uh, but the, the castle starting off, it, it's Resident Evil style. You crawl through, like, say, a few secret passages to get somewhere. You get chased for a bit. Mm. And then you, and these, um, the fodder enemies, I think I'm going to be more happy of these than in Resident Evil 7. Uh, this gave a totally different vibe to the village stuff. It was less scary, I would say, like I, because like I'm not going into a cornfield where people, things are growling at me and they're going to kill me. But yeah, I, for all in all, I think because I had already been through that section before and the mm-hmm. visual experience, I wasn't so draw like terrified. But I do this- have a couple couple quick quick questions, yeah. like because they've done they they've made it so that the persistent enemy is like I mean they, obviously it started years ago. You can argue that Nemesis was the first one, whatever. But I feel like since Resident Evil Two's Mr. X and then Nemesis and now with Dimitri or the sister. Um, or your daughter, sorry. Um, how does that stuff feel? Like, does it? Is there any part of you that gets sick of getting stuck in the rooms, or does it? Does it feel like there's new dynamics to the way that she pursues you and things like that? Well, this this one of this daughter, I forget her name again. Sorry, but um, it, she attacks you and then sort of like lets you go, and you because she's not a nemesis, mm. uh, you can walk around her and you don't get thrown to the floor like you would do with Mister X. Mm-hmm. And I feel like it it's a different compliment, and it's not like a um also like a, a Doctor Salvador from Four where it's an instant kill, dead you're gone, sorry right. sort of thing. So I think it's a nice mixture. I'm, I'm curious to see how Lady Matrice is because 
in the trailers we've seen, I, I, I won't go into specifics because I know Josh hasn't seen any of this. I don't want to say anything, but I feel like she might be more of a one hit slap sort of like, or maybe you get two of her, but I feel mm. like with the daughters, because they're talking to you as well. Like Mr. X doesn't talk to you. Nemesis goes, stars, give me a kiss. <laughs> and, um, but this one's, you, you get she's talking about how she really misses warm man flesh and she wants to just drink your blood and just come here like it just it's, so it's really sort of like chilling and she's take you can tell she's taking her time as well she's not really running after you she's walking and right. you're covered with flies and it's more listening to it and more like the game forcing you in a direction because if you were in that area you'd probably take about another half an hour to have a look around before you went and grabbed the thing you need to do to go I saw through. like a couple of playthroughs where people were just dumping like entire clips into like the uh I forget yeah. what she's called, but um yeah the, that well I did look up their names, but there's three of them. So it's like whatever the one that's made of flies is called. Yeah. And um you know dumping an entire clip into that person it's just like I don't know if you guys feel the same way, but to some degree sometimes when you're stuck in a room with one of these persistent enemies and there's not that much you can do other than sort of lure them away a bit and hope they stay over there for a bit and then you run back again and it all gets a bit alien isolation. Like I'm kind of hoping that they put more gameplay possibilities in there maybe things in the environment that you can trigger to sort of like you know space you away from the persistent enemy like is there any sort of hint that they're doing anything other uh, for this my, one my guessing is the daughters will all be sort of like sections it won't be like you'll be in the castle and you're going to be constantly chased by them i think mm. the priest may be one of them but it seems there seems to be sort of like passageways within the castle mm -hmm. that i've seen so far which are going to be used like uh, shimmy through and I, I i reckon just like within resident evil 2 less so resident evil 3 but in resident evil 2 you will know when you're going to be en end up triggering her so i, I can have it around it's, it's a handy gimmick but if it's the whole game then it mm. becomes a bit tedious and but then again like i love daily alien isolation so you know but even <laughs> that yeah. did, if that that surprisingly going back to that that breaks up a lot more than what you re I'm not saying you personally Scott, mm. what you will remember but like there are there are like you say like at least a third of that game is downtime away from the xenomorph and I feel mm. like that's going to be the case here yeah I think one of the like the best ways to do any persistent enemy is you have to you have to have some downtime because if it is just that constant state of like oh my god I'm about to get killed it's an instant kill or I'm yeah. getting hounded by this thing and it's just punching me from off screen or whatever that can get really annoying but um, I couldn't do any damage to her with any of the stuff I available so she would just mm. sort of like morph away and let the bullets go through so you know at this point it, it's just a runaway sort of jobby because i love the the realization in, in seven that you can put jack down like if you empty enough bullets into him he will go down he sits back up again like undertaker style but like you can yeah. get him to go down for a little bit um josh what's your thoughts on like i guess the persistent enemies and the way that it's like a signature thing and or more of a signature thing in resident evil now yeah, totally. I mean, um, like Jack Baker in Resident Evil 7, I really enjoyed that at the time. You know, like the first moment where he comes through the wall and you're not expecting mm. him to just be able to do that. I remember that blowing my mind, but he did get to a point where, you know, I, I just needed something just from a specific room and I was like, just leave me alone. And especially because it's first person, you know, when you get in one of those grab animations and you're just constantly locked into it, it can feel a little disorientating and a little bit frustrating. I thought Mr. X was much better handled. I know a lot of people had their problems with how he was just always there, but I always felt like when I was facing off against him and I was exploring the Raccoon City Police Department, I always felt like I um, wasn't getting locked into those same frustrating moments over and over again or mm. getting into a position where he was no longer scary and he was just a nuisance. So hopefully with Resier, you know, they kind of like blend the best of both worlds and have that unpredictability. But like Roy was saying, you know, hopefully have them in specific sections so it's not the full game you don't get to those positions where you're just like come on dude and i need that wrench give me the wrench just let me <laughs> just get just let me lever. shimmy past you yeah you know what? stop doing the big hard man thing just just let me let me get by mm -hmm. jack did these um this daughter was better than jack where you you weren't getting turned around you were getting grabbed but then you could sort of almost then just walk past her and keep going but uh mm. there was another thing that i forgot to mention which i said to you this morning scott it's like I might turn the haptics off after a few a few Ooh. hours of this, or I might turn it right down because when those um, goblin lads in the dungeon were taking five bullets and the trigger's really fighting you with just a pistol mm -hmm. and you need to get rounds off and there's like, say, five of them at once at some points and you need to sort of like put bullets and turn them down. The haptics was... I get it, but it's getting in the... I think it, it was in the way. Too, too intrusive to the point mm -hmm. where like... 
I didn't think I'd be turning it off, but I probably will, especially for like a hardcore run and stuff like that. We've we talked about it a few times, but like the haptic stuff, I think for me, it goes like what if a game needs you to be responding to stuff fast, like if it's something that's twitch, like you're twitching, it's a twitch reaction, shoot a call of duty. Like I turned them off in Black Ops. Um, because I was like, I want to return fire as fast as possible, and I'm fighting this trigger for even a half millisecond is enough for me to not get the shot off, and it just doesn't yeah. feel satisfying. It feels like it gets in the way. Um, obviously, we're gonna talk about return in a little bit. Um, but like Josh, I think you've been one of the biggest like supporters of haptics. Are you leaving this stuff on like regardless? I think so. And even though you know, Ben I just mentioned there that for Resi 8, I haven't played the demos yet. I'm just sort mm-hmm. of like just keeping away from them until the game actually releases. But one of my biggest drawbacks with Resi 7 from the parts that I've actually played out of VR is that the um, gunplay just it was quite good, but it just never felt there for me never felt like mm-hmm. as weighty or as impactful as it should should have been and i like in resi games where you kind of just have a pistol or a shotgun you've got you know you've got a bit of ammo but every shot feels like it should count mm-hmm. and for me again you know not having the first hand experience i'm quite looking forward to the haptics perhaps facilitating that or making the impact feel a bit more visceral and a bit more powerful so it doesn't feel like i'm kind of like a bit floaty or you know firing off these ineffective guns because from what i can gather like in most recent resi games like the enemies take a lot of bullets to go down in some cases and i feel like if i if i have that resistance it would at least feel like i'm doing some impactful damage so Mm -hmm. you know in theory i'm going to keep them on but in practice i might end up being annoyed as well (laughs) I guess it depends for me. It's it's I'm kind of like with like with the way that Roy described it, where it's like if I'm going up against a bunch of enemies, I'm just trying to get some shots off, and I'm fi- I'm kind of half fighting the controller, and um, just to sort of respond to the stuff on screen. Then it's it takes me out of it because I'm suddenly aware of the piece of tech in my hand and not the experience that's on screen. But I guess that's going to change uh, game by game. One thing I was going to ask um, as a wider thing for Resident Evil A, um, for I guess Ben Roy for you first. Do you have any wider predictions for like the structure of the game? Like, do you feel like this is oh. it? Because I feel like they're hiding something massive, and we haven't seen any of it yet. I just feel like they're so upfront with like here's the village it's quite short because we've already seen the transition into the castle in the demo and um, at least you can see it right there at the end of the first demo and then if we do the castle stuff you know you're fighting the doors you fight lady dimitris but then we have all the separate stuff with harry man with chris redfield yeah. heisenberg with everything else do you think they've got something else in mind man there's there's something going on with ethan there's a reason we've not seen ethan's face yet mm. and i don't know if you've heard my prediction before uh josh i Barry. have i don't think josh has Ethan I have, is actually. Ethan's <laughs> going to be some, tell everyone because it's, it's good. Ethan's going to be some sort of important character. Maybe I don't know. Maybe Ethan's Wesker. Maybe Ethan someone else. I'm thinking we, Wesker. We, we've we've not seen. Yeah. It. Yeah. Uh, just like why haven't we seen Ethan's face? Because in, in Resident Evil Seven, when he's unconscious and you become Mia, mm-hmm. uh, his face is on the floor and he gets pulled away. And then you, when you see him again, he's got his mouth exposed and the rest of him is covered. And we've just never seen his face since. And I feel like there's going to be some sort of a reveal with him. There's going to be a reveal with Mother Miranda that because um she's been uh, Jill Valentine, seen, isn't it? I mean, yeah, yeah, Jill, Claire, anyone. <laughs> I feel like I feel like you've got to bring some old characters back at this point, especially if this is Chris's last hurrah. Like you can't have Chris's last hurrah and then Claire not be there in some sort mm. of form. And also, we've had this trait once before of Alex Wesker in Resident Evil Revelations Two morphing her mind into a young child so if she can do that why can't another another member of project w project west could do it right. albert himself and then either go shift into ethan or even i don't know maybe it's jake maybe jake Mueller's <laughs> around here you know what i mean like jake even existed for a sec but it's just like i guess they need something to pay off because they have all that artwork of him just having a complete silhouette shadow yeah. face and either that's because they want to have an anonymous character, a blank slate that you can project yourself onto and play that way. But I also feel like it's Capcom, it's Resident Evil. Like you might as well do something big with it. There's also like, you see a, like a few frames of this underground thing. And I was like, I can mm. sort of like piece together. Like I definitely think this might be one of the first, like the, the whole foot, the, the umbrella logo, right? Has not really been in the past few games much at all. Not even like six but it was shown in five for like a second when they went into the underground labs in Africa. Uh, this is tied to the house structure of the region. Like the houses are based around, like you see the four logos, right? Uh, this is all I'm describing in the trailer. Sorry, Josh, if, if you want me to just say it's No, not. go on. But this is all, it's all the four houses, Heisenberg, Dimitris, and the other two that we haven't really had named yet. They're tied to the slogan, like specifically, they're how, and 
it's everywhere. And it, what do you mean, like from an aerial view, where they are on the map looks like an umbrella logo? When it's like you see the the umbrella logo, and then you have the Dimitris logo, the Heisenberg logo, B B, and there's four houses in the region, mm. like four families, like mm. in the game, of, your houses like Game of Thrones, and not not just not just the house where someone lives, but. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's integrally di- um, tied to that. I don't know, this might be one of the origin sites of Umbrella because this dates back to the 50s and it would time with like the early pharmaceutical days because they didn't become Umbrella Corp properly until like the late 70s. So, you know, it, there's all this sort of thing turning in there. And I feel like uh, and Dimitris has been around and lording over that area for 70 years now. So it's just what are they hmm. sort of doing and... Uh, I feel like they're using folk tales of werewolves and vampires more so because they're not going to be illegit like mystical magic stuff. It's I think they're using the folk tales to keep the surrounding stuff in line. And you know, the, the, you can say, "Oh, why? Why is no one there?" Oh, because they're scared of werewolves. And the government goes, "Lol, there's no such thing as werewolves." You know what I mean? I feel Actually, like that is. If they go back far enough where Umbrella's been doing these like ancient experiments for so long, yeah. they've produced these weird hybrids before they quote unquote refined it into even the zombie style, um, you know, reaction to the um, different formulas and stuff that the werewolves and the, the different creatures are all like those initial ancient experiments, then that would be a cool twist. I don't know if that's going to may- maybe mean that Ethan's identity is tied into Umbrella, that he's like yeah. the descendant of someone from Umbrella. Well, I, I get one more. I'm sorry, Josh. I get every time I see one thing, I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> like every, everyone says his name at one point in the trailer and i don't know if they're just clipped out the duke saying his name and Dimitri. oh and they say ethan yeah and yeah. and heisenberg but everyone seems to know this lad as if he's like oh, a, someone spe- someone special yeah or and i also think that mia maybe who um have you seen have you do you know anything about this josh <laughs> i do i do <laughs> when me, when, me, when i really me, appreciate your concern i do know yeah. this stuff and this isn't me like shooting on you either like, for anyone that it sounds like I'm just I'm just scared because I just don't want to ruin it. But when when <laughs> she becomes one with lead in her face, uh I feel like that might not be real Mia. Or that might, out, yeah. I feel like that the Mia that we got out of Resident Evil 7 was a replicant, or maybe she's become something else since because everyone that's had viruses in the past, Jill, uh Sherry, they've all been affected by it. they've all like had some sort of abilities and they ain't gonna just come out of this all happy, especially that gooey, gooey sort of mole stuff. And Evelyn got into their minds and projected stuff. So I feel like Mia might not be Mia anymore, or if not, she's saying, "Oh, the reason their child is from that virus, and that's maybe why they need the child for Mother Miranda." I'm just going into this. You know, I need to be pulled out of this because. <laughs> I did a video about it last week. I'm just falling deeper and deeper. We should heartily recommend your uh, theory video because it's awesome. That's already on the channel. That's also got the stuff in about what's really going on with Lady Dimitris and the daughters um, and some some mad, mad fun in regards to Wesker um, and yeah. his connection to Resident Evil 8. So that stuff's out there too. Um, we can kind of connect some stuff um, back to the haptics point. I was going to ask this about Returnal um, to sort of pivot into Returnal stuff. Um, Josh, what's, how does that game handle haptic feedback? How does it play? I know you're like blown away by it. So just where's, your, where's your mind at on the old Returnal? Lads, 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 you know, I mean, I've been playing it nonstop for the past week or so now. Like, just, you discovered 2 a.m. I've discovered the, <laughs> the, the time 2 a.m. for once. I feel like you both, my, my voice is going, my brain's going, my eyes are going. I'm just, <laughs> it's all returnal at the moment. And like you said at the beginning, we're going to have like the full review out um, later on this week. But I can talk a little bit about what the, in the first two biomes and stuff about the dual sense, because the dual sense is like the crown jewel of the overall experience, the thing that ties it together. I think me included, you know, watching the trailers for it previously, watching all of the marketing, the gameplay videos that Sony's put out, its state of players or whatever. Um, it looks pretty good, but it doesn't look necessarily that special. And I think that's because the dual sense is so much a part of it and you don't mm. get to convey that through the trailers. Like you just don't get a sense of it until it's in your hand. Like it's crazy how much immersion it adds, not just with... The way it gives you more functionality with how you can, you know, use specific items. For instance, you know, I've mentioned in the preview one we did, Scott, like if Mm -hmm. you hold the left trigger halfway down, you get to do the regular aiming zoom. If you pull past the tension, you get to activate the all fire. So you're getting like more dynamism from your controller in that sense. But it's the way like it uses rumble, the way it uses that resistance, the way it uses the inbuilt sound to kind of you know, connect you to that character more. You know, you mentioned when you're playing Black Ops or something, you're very aware that you're using the controller and it takes you out of it. For me, when I'm playing Returnal, at least, it makes me feel like I'm in the game more. It makes me feel like I have this connection with whatever weapon, you know, the character's using, with whatever um, augment she has on whatever given moment. And it's, it's funny how it kind of like 
affects it because it's not something you're necessarily thinking about. You just sort of, it just blends with what you're seeing on screen to create this like really immersive um, like experience that knocks down like the barrier between you and the screen. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things where, you know, I played it in Astro Boy had it too. Astro Bot, Astro Boy, Astro Bot. I keep playing Astro, Astro Boy. Boy, yeah. Yeah, Astro Boy. Astro Boy had it as well. Um, but that was obviously like, you know, a tech demo. And I was wondering, oh, well, is anyone, is anyone going to use this functionality to its, um, you know, biggest extent in a proper game? Mm -hmm. In Returnal actually does. And it just makes me so excited to see how it's going to evolve because it's so good now. And we're like six months or whatever. I don't know what time is. A few months away <laughs> from like the, the consoles actually coming out. And it's mm -hmm. this good now. And it makes me kind of, you know, think about going to, other games, older games, and I feel like if I go from Returnal to a to a third person shooter like it, I'll be missing that functionality. I'll be missing right. that added layer. I how's, think that's awesome. How's the um, dual sense battery life with everything kicking off that much when you're playing Ooh. like constantly? Um, I haven't noticed it be any worse than regular. You know, the dual sense okay. doesn't have an amazing. Mine thing, is was... like three hours. Like, if I right. I, I yeah. had. Mine proper died while playing a uh, odd world, uh, odd world Odyssey. I'm saying the wrong thing because the chanting is tight and it vibrates the controller and yep. pushes the thing down. Anything and, with, I mean, I was just playing wind jammers. Anything with regular and the speaker as well just kills it. So yeah. odd world, so just odd world uses all three of those at once and was rinsing my controller. But yeah, mm. back to the was that I kind mean, of the same thing on Returnal? Though? I mean, like I guess you can just have it plugged in. You can just sort of try and charge a lot but does it feel like like those like that amount of features coming from the controller does burn through it a bit faster like i guess it's almost the same as like any other sort of triple a thing yeah sort of i mean i'm sure it probably does not to the point where i was playing returnal thinking man like this is rinsing this is going right. through this battery life really quick you know if you played miles morales or if you've played demon souls or call of duty black ops or something or astro bot mm -hmm. slash boy um, I think it's like just the same level. It did, like I say, like, you know, I could tell that the controller was using a lot of juice, especially when it was raining. I was getting this really dynamic vibration across the board, but I was never kind of running to plug it in during key moments or mm. anything like that. Fun anyway. fact from that, uh, the, the rain thing, the whole, idea, the whole idea that the console, sorry, the controller can mimic the feeling of rain. Uh, this comes from Danny O'Dwyer over on Noclip. Apparently Team Asobo, the developers of Astrobot, um, they their whole thing is that they get given tech super early, like the super early hardware or whatever for the PlayStation 5. And they sit and just think of like, okay, what are the what are all the different implementations of this tech that we can think of? And so they that's why Astrobot is such a showcase of all these different ways that it could be used like a, a bow and arrow or like, you know, textures and textures you could walk on or the idea of, the, of um, you know, rain and stuff, which um, the, their findings then get given to all the first party teams or like get shown, mm -hmm. oh, this is how you would do rain. This is how we programmed it in, which I think is why Returnal kind of has that feeling similar to Astrobot because um, I guess they would have worked with Team Asoba. Um, you were saying that you like, you, it, it really gets you, like it's got such a loop. Like, I mean, you'd kind of described it to me on the old preview as like Doom meets Control meets Hades or whatever, which for yeah. me is like the perfect explanation of it. Um, how is your thoughts on it changed over time? How's the, how does it handle story stuff as well? Um, I know, like, the minute you can, you're only limited to the first two biomes yeah. and- Yeah, um, so, and tell me the video. ending now, tell me the ending. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll just- <laughs> um, It's a uh, like this the story stuff is like Jim. fascinating, just the way they've tried to like mesh, you know, like the structure of the rogue, like with the story of like a Sony character driven thing. Like mm. it's, I think it's something that Ben Roy would quite dig because it's really like sci-fi horror, like infused and you're getting these sort of flashes to a potential past, a potential future. Every single time you die, you know, you get still images Oh, we're not still images, but like a, a quick couple second glimpse at certain images that you can then connect the more you die, the more stuff you uncover in the world and stuff. And I think what it does so well is that when I've played rogue likes in the past, when I've done, you know, runs and stuff, sometimes I feel like not that I'm wasting my time, but I'm not getting anywhere. I'm not getting anything from it. You know, obviously I'm understanding the layout a bit more, mm. understanding the enemies, playing for high scores or as far as I can go or whatever. But with Returnal, every single part of these systems and every single mechanic kind of like rewards you for doing a run, whether that's, you know, getting to grips with the consumables, getting to find upgrades, getting to level up your guns, getting to find a new um, bit of story information or a bit of a uh, audio log or something. So every single time you're doing something, you feel like you're making progress, even if you just might be getting your ass kicked and like going back to the start. And for me as someone who could never really connect with a roguelike in that way before, like I felt 
I was engrossed in it. In you know, I said in that preview, once you get in like Returnal's rhythm, once you get into the flow of it, like you know, a lot of games get criticized for being kind of like mindless, for your eyes glazing over, for you becoming like one with the game. But like, <laughs> it takes a lot of skill to to pull that off. Totally. And when you're in this game and you sort of just like feel like it might as well be plugged straight into your veins and you're like just interfacing with it. Like yeah, that is that. something special, man. I haven't had that feeling in a long time where you're completely, you completely become like super synergistic with the experience. You're not even thinking of anything around you. You're just the game. I haven't yeah. had that set of mechanics in a game in a long time. Um, ben, what your thoughts on Return? I think you're a bit more, you're, I mean, I've, I've been just, just mining away yeah. at the, the glorious rock that is Josh Brown to get as much information on this game as possible. <laughs> but what are your thoughts on the old 70 pound Returnal? I feel like I'm being a bit ignorant with the whole 70 pound stance and the roguelite stance and, and seeing more and more when hearing more and more about like the sci-fi sort of the I think the price going. stuff is totally valid. I think a lot of people yeah. are going to be that's just too much. But it's also even if I wasn't uh, sort of like that the price even if I took away everything that was going to stop me now like because it's kind of around some other things but the the way that Josh was mentioned about this is it sci-fi horror elements you said or something like that or yeah totally yeah, yeah just style. just and the visuals of it the more I look is like ah oh, this looks like I like this sort of <laughs> and I'm I, like everyone else I'm desperate to play a game that is made for this new generation and I feel like even though Resident Evil 8 is going to count for that because I feel like they downported it for the past gen I'm very curious about that yeah but I'm um, like I feel like because I forget like the Phantom Pain came up for PS3 like mm -hmm. you what and like <laughs> Shadow of Mordor but yeah like I just I just need to know, like, how does it does it feel like the Sony story? I mean, the Sony experience, or like the <laughs> like the, the creme de la creme sort of thing with this whole uh, the roguelike element of it being reset because the first roguelike that really sort of grabbed me was like Void Bastards mm -hmm. and um, Spelunky, those sort of games. And I Void Bastards had some funny writing, and Spelunky had maybe like a bit of text, but nothing. I was never there for the narrative stuff, so I'd need to like. I, I don't have my faith in the narrative element, even though, because like House Mark before, I've done like Resogun and Dead Nation games that I've enjoyed. But again, like it's it's more like the score time attack, the game, it's the raw gameplay rather than the story thing. And I think I want a, a sort of like a, some sort of heavy side of my story here. And am I going to get that? Like, I don't, I don't know, whatever you can say without Jim knocking you out. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's definitely like i'm not going to pretend in pretend it's like the last of us or pretend it's like mm. god of war or anything in terms of its story because i don't think it is because that's definitely not necessarily its focus like first and foremost it's like a mechanical treat like if you yeah. like solid mechanics if you like gameplay loops like that's what it is first and foremost but it does have this ex extra element of story and what's so appealing is like the atmosphere of the locations and like the world and the law like the mythology is again like surprisingly deep like there's a real richness to the places you're exploring and the more than just like empty rooms to fill up with enemies you know like there's a real story being told as you go and it's because it's so steep in that sci-fi horror kind of um you know aesthetic like for me that's that's what i'm here for i'm here for these big technical boys like flying around and oh what's going on i need to go deeper into the world why am i in this time loop what's yeah. this house that keeps appearing and stuff and you do get those character driven moments where like the, the perspective switches like this is all in the trailer i think or something they've showed up before yeah the perspective switches you walk into like this house and you get these kind of like story dumps that you can connect the dots with like later where it becomes like more overtly horror focused and i loved those little segues i just think it's like it's so well paced because there's always something new to break it up you know even though you are just doing a lot of fighting you're doing a lot of boss battles some boss battles you're picking up a lot of data logs you're scanning a lot of things like it's just it's i don't know how they've paced it so well considering it's so procedurally generated in a lot of parts and i think that just helps because of the atmosphere because of this kind of like vague story thing and because of you know the ultimate world that you're in and exploring i was gonna ask because like hades feels that felt like it sort of set this new bar on how to even do a story in a roguelike and i know that we're only talking about the first two biomes and the <laughs> first uh, one of the first bosses um but i guess comparing those two did it pull because hades is known for making this incredible first impression where it's like oh my god this is such a intricately designed mythos and law and uh, you can you can feel the amount of just the sheer amount of writing that went into that game to make all that stuff work and did you get a similar vibe from returnal because i was just I, I said this to you before um 
you know, the podcast and stuff. It's like, if I was part of uh, Housemark and I was making this supposedly revolutionary, you know, new next gen roguelike take on the genre and everything. And then I saw Hades, I would be kicking myself because I'd be really annoyed mm-hmm. that the thing that we were going to debut has maybe been done better. Um, how, how are the Hades comparisons? I think it's like inevitable, you know, it's one of the mm. most highly acclaimed roguelikes to ever come out. One of the best games of last year or whatever won all these awards. So there's going to be like these obvious comparisons. And I guess there are differences between the two. You know, Hades is, like you said, so like um, dialogue driven in a lot of mm. ways. You're constantly talking to these different gods. You're constantly returning to your home base, talking to a bunch of people. Whereas in Returnal, it's just you on your lonesome trying to like figure things out. So it's a lot of like Celine talking to herself. It's a lot of Celine um, talking, not talking to, but kind of getting the audio logs from her other like failed uh. room where she's died, which is really interesting and grim. So you've kind of got like got characters, but the characters are all like other That's versions cool, of though. her, which how, is how much interesting. How much does it feel like? I, I don't know why I, I, my brain is flying towards the end of Live, Die, Repeat, where you get those <laughs> like the, the, uh, Tom Cruise and... Uh, Emily, uh, Emily, Blunt. Emily Blunt. I like <laughs> they get into the end sort of section. The aliens all look gooey. And they look a bit like the, some of the visuals I've seen from that game. And I don't know. Now I'm thinking of Lift RP and how much I love that film. And I don't know. Now I'm, I'm. Can you say? I guess you're smiling. Are you? Are you allowed to speak? Or <laughs> I don't I'm, think I'm allowed to speak. You know, it's just a, a natural I comparison. I am I? Am I totally off the ball there? Like some of the stylings of the, how the story might go out or. Well, not necessarily well, to... how the story will end up, but you know the idea of it being like you know lived out. Is she aware like, of this? I, I, I don't even know. Yeah. To... Okay, cool. I don't even know how to say that. Is she aware of this uh, situation she's been bestowed upon her of yeah. not being well, out? Well, I mean, the footage probably... that's out there at the minute um, is already the very beginning of the game. IGN did the very beginning of it, so there is like Celine finding yeah. her first self and then realizing mm-hmm. that she has been here before. Um, but yeah, well, like yeah. Yeah, that's just like an, that's like an interesting part of it as well because you know you're practically like Selena is her own character, but she's also an avatar for you because you're both exploring the world together. You both understand that you're trapped in this time loop. So every single time you die, every single time you get kicked back, like her exasperation with it, kind of like mimics your own. You know, if you're very close to getting to the end of the first biome or beating the first boss or whatever, then you get kicked back, and you both are like, "Damn it!" But you still have that drive to kind of go again now seeing a lot of um comparisons with live die repeat slash edge of tomorrow whatever you want to call it mm-hmm. call it and i do think that's quite apt as well they're like stylistically a little bit similar and um, you know not not like overtly so but i think that's quite a good point of comparison if you've um if you enjoy that movie i feel like a lot of that would translate over to the game as well it sounds it, it looks it looks like the visuals of like the new alien films where they're more tied up and clean and the themes of live therapy of tomorrow so like yeah it kind of sounds like my my stuff i I I think for me like the biggest thing is that we don't know how it's going to go we have no like we we know it's a third person shooter and that's kind of it and we know it's a roguelike but then it's just like the way the story's been done the way the story's been presented the fact that you access it kind of hades style bits and pieces it's sort of in the lore it's sort of in like you know, you're going to get some dedicated cutscenes. I just love that we don't yeah. fully know everything going in, which is such a rarity these days. Like most at least of the time now, you know exactly what you're getting. At least it's something different, and it's not open world and all this sort of thing. I, I'm I'm here for something new and different. Mm-hmm. I think there's just the barrier of like, oh, it's um, a ro- do I want to spend this much on the roguelike? And I guess this is a hump me and we as humans have to get over at some point i'm super and... super curious because like um obviously the launch day is the 30th and i think that like a lot of the reception has been super positive so far all the preview stuff like, our yeah. preview is like very positive and i'm just like the general you know vibe around it is you should play this game but i feel like the 70 pound price point or 70 dollars or whatever is such a massive barrier and like i had just put out like a little twitter poll a couple of weeks ago just saying like is this going to get in the way for a lot of people and that was the most popular response just people just saying like, i'm just gonna have to wait until it goes down but if, yeah I'm curious is well, how that re- pairs off not even resident evil 8 on ps5 is that mm. much it's just 54 it's very so like yeah. sony pricing point it's very them yeah. going, like, oh we're first party like you know we, we are big sony um, and i wonder whether that's in the foot like it's really frustrating because i think you know obviously that price point it's going to benefit the the biggest of the biggest sony first party games you know it's not going to affect god of war it's not going to affect horizon mm. it's not going to certainly not going to affect spider-man 2 like they're going to make more money people are going to buy them regardless mm-hmm. but what it pushes out are these kind of like 
quote unquote riskier projects where, you know, Housemark, if you love PlayStation, you probably love Housemark's previous games. But, you know, to like the casual fan, they're not going to look at that name in the same way they look at, you know, Naughty Dog. They'll recognize that. They'll know the history of that. They'll play Naughty Dog games and therefore might be more willing to spend 70 pounds on it here. Like Roy was saying, you know, you've got this roguelike, you've got this, you know, studio that hasn't done anything on this scale before you've got it coming out on the playstation 5 70 pounds it's a lot to think about i think mm. ultimately you know not just fraternal but other games like it in the future i think the price point just works against it you know and it kind of and it sucks for them because it's almost like sony's creating a self-fulfilling prophecy if they release games like this for 70 pounds and no one plays them and then everyone still plays and buys, you know, God of War and stuff. They're going to say, well, people only want to play God of War. People only want to mm-hmm. play Spider-Man. So then we'll stop uh, greenlighting these in the first place. But ignoring the fact that, you know, it's just a high barrier for entry. And it's a lot of money for someone to spend on something that they might be unsure about, especially at launch, you know? Yeah, this and- is just, this is not the release to trial a higher price point mm-hmm. on. And with Housemark, like they had, they've only done, I'm not, it's like they've only had smaller games done before. And then mm-hmm. they had that battle royale that they sort of canned, mm-hmm. I think, at the last hour. And like, I get that this is a, like a luxury hobby. And I mean, we're, we're arguing over the price point of like 10, 15 pounds dollars. And like, is that really on the grand scheme? But I think it does so much for like the, so the the minutiae at the front, like it's just that extra number, like the, the way that, that people price things, one ninety nine, like you have the ninety nine on. Yeah, it, there's a whole psychology just, to it. Yeah, it just it's hit different that way. I think if it was, I mean, it's I've seen it out there in like um some places for sixty already, like you can sell websites, but like I think because it's just hit that way, and if it was the sixty, I, I might have tried to squeeze it in between mm-hmm. RE eight and the Mass Effect trilogy, but yeah, I just it's more I'm worried, I'm not. Not worried, but because of house marks come out of this sort of like weird period, and they they sort of, it feels like they're leveling up. Even though if you make smaller games, you're not bad, but like it feels like they're going into a new sort of area where they've not really done this before, mm-hmm. and then they've got the seventy pound hurdle to deal with, and then we've had all the Days Gone stuff recently, <laughs> and then we've <laughs> yeah, had, I mean, that's the and thing. then. I'm going to buy, I mean, I'm an idiot because I'm going to, I'll spend 70 pounds for the last of us remake because I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, so I don't know. I, I don't know what's the, pro- I, I'm the, probably the problem here. I but no, there, are, there are so many conversations right now around, you know, which titles within Sony's catalog get supported. There was that whole thing from, uh, it wasn't, maybe it was John Garvin, one of the ex Sony Ben guys um, saying, look, if you want to support something like Days Gone, pay, f- pay full price for it. Um, at launch and obviously that's a whole conversation around just throwing your money at something and hoping for the best but that almost carries over to this where you want to support new ip and you want to support new ideas and hope that it like pays off in the long run um but like it's just i'm just super fascinated how that goes i guess we'll know by this time next week at the the initial weekend sales and everything and whether or not the positive reception to it actually translates into sales um, or whether sony have just ended up shooting themselves in the foot because to bring it back to the developer side like you said this is their most ambitious project by a landslide like they've they're such a nicely trusted arcadey style studio and to branch out into what looks like this insanely ambitious you know third person 3d roguelike that's a bullet hell yeah. shooter that's never been done in 3d apart from risk of rain 2 um or some of the near games then the, yeah i just i want to see it pay off and i just kind of hope that it does um but yeah let us know what you think down in the comments below of the uh, resident evil demos if you've managed to get some hands on time or what you think of returnal will you be picking it up or does the price tag make you run for the hills for now this has been the world culture gaming podcast i've been your host scott Hilford, joined by ben roy turner I'm going to go and play some more Roy Public Commando now. That's horrible. <laughs> and Josh Brown. I'm going to play some Roy Eternal and then I'll be back. Fantastic. Catch you next time. Bye. Bye. Aww. See you later.